Welcome back. This is Alex Makarski of Startup Gizmo, and we're hanging out with Andrew Gregg for the second time, this time to talk about the whole issue of education and how outdated the education is. And maybe I'll give Andrew a little bit of an introduction. Andrew is an inventor, innovator. He can Frankenstein a bunch of unrelated ideas to create something new and unique. He's the alchemist. He's a ninth grade dropout who is going to change the world. And he's going to talk about education, how it's going to impact the world through the new education system that he's working on. Andrew, welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for setting the bar so high. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> I didn't set it so high. You did. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so, so, yeah, so uh, speaking of what you said is, you know, dropped out in grade nine. So, uh, you know, what, what's my story and what's my why, right? You know, why am I here? Why am I doing these things, right? Well, my mom was uh, a single mother because my father was an alcoholic and he, he, he broke up with my mom, you know, when we were young. My sister's three years younger. So, um, so I dropped out of school because, you know, my mom was working long hours and uh, school didn't fit for me because it was, it was kind of boring and repeating things over and over, right? It just, I just didn't fit. So... Luckily, I became an entrepreneur and, and made something, you know, and, and, and did some things. But a lot of people, of course, don't feel comfortable in a system where you're not able to allow it to be, you know, to have critical thinking and to question things and to be able to be self-directed in learning. You know, it's like, what would your reason be to need math and English and typing or whatever it would be at the time, you know, if you didn't have a why, right? You know, people don't do things without a reason. Like, what's the why, right? So, so, so I just didn't fit the system very well. So... Uh, I became a DJ and I built some other businesses, ended up working with uh, with Google and with computers and phones and stuff and so on, uh, Google Apps reseller. Um, but what I learned was... Did you need to become an engineer so you have a career in that? Uh, no, no, you definitely don't. Uh, yeah, although if you worked at Google inside of Google, then yes, they, 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 were pretty, they were pretty picky about that until one thing happened. You know, and it's interesting how one thing's happened. A young guy came in that was just a, you know, like a co-op student type stuff or an intern at Google, and he didn't have an engineering degree. So he said, look, I have this idea, and I think it's going to be really big. And they said, well, when you grow up and you get your engineering degree, because you have to have your software engineering degree to be, you know, management or executives or do anything. So once you've got that, then we can work on your idea. So he didn't like that answer. So he left Google and he created something called Instagram and sold it for a billion dollars to the competitor. So they're they're looking at changing that that rule because um, it it doesn't seem to serve them quite as well as they they hoped. So yeah, young people are incredible because it's what they don't know that's important. That's the important part. It's the part they don't know. So if you don't know what can't be done, the possibilities are endless. They're limitless, right? Unlimited, right? So so anyway, so back on track with. So uh, I became an entrepreneur. I ended up, though, to fast forward, being a teacher at a private school for kindergarten to grade 12 for a, uh, a private school, the most highly accredited private school in Costa Rica. Uh, so I was, I was learning, right, uh, from the kids. And I asked them, I said, you know, why do you guys call yourselves the last generation? They said, because it's over. We're not empowered to be able to, to do anything, and the parents had a party, and we can't even clean up. They won't even let us. I'm, I'm sorry. Who calls themselves the last generation? The kids, the school kids. They don't call themselves Generation X or whatever. They call themselves the last generation. That's mm -hmm. what they call themselves. And I was like, wow, okay. That was a surprise and a big gulp, you know. I was like, wow, that doesn't <laughs> – they, 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 they've given up, right? They're like, no, forget it. So – this really concerned me. So I, I said, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. This is what I've done and shared with them and showed them the Google stuff and the tools. And they're like, okay. Then I showed them Sagata Mitra and how you can get 16 years of education and only three years. And there's 16 years worth of proof. A girl on the front cover that's you know, of Wired Magazine that's 12 years of age said to be the next Steve Jobs of the world because they, she used this self-directed learning uh, format. Uh, Sagata Mitra, who won the... Uh, the, the TED Talk Prize of a million dollars for his uh, for his stuff showing how kids left alone with a computer with a hole in the wall will uh, within nine months all test out at being at a grade ten level um, just left alone with the computer and then documented all this and you can go take a look at that to delve into it deeper because it's it's completely unbelievable but when you experience it 
it, it makes a lot of sense and you see it happen and it's definitely for real. So 16 years were the proof of that. So if you leave them alone for three years, now remember these kids had never seen a computer before, had no prior education and could not speak English. So they had to learn how to use a computer by themselves with no tutoring, learn English and had you know no base to be able to get started, right? So that's 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 freaky. So he also it is, it is breaking. Uh, I I just want to direct someone listening to this to go to YouTube and just Google, just look for Sagada Mitra and then we'll find videos showing all this process. Yeah, I just put in type in hole in the wall in in uh, and TED Talks and it, it'll pop up because it's very popular. And then you'll be able to see what happened because uh, it's incredible how four kids get in front of a computer, ask a big question like, why is the sky blue? You know, can you kill a goat by staring at it? Why is there racism? They, in a 40 minutes to 60 minutes, they do a presentation, turn around, do it to the rest of the group staring and watching behind them. Then they rotate. And they just keep doing this. And that's how they rapidly learn, but it's self-directed. Then they have a need for all the other skill sets, right? Uh, so that's... So that's the interesting part is that left to their own devices, kids will, you know, like Montessori scores and uh, Montessori and Wardell schools were orphanages because it's your parents that will screw you up, <laughs> okay? Because what serves them does not serve you, but they want you to be able to continue with their model that no longer serves anybody. And that's 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 the legacy that parents give, and, and you know, and, and uh, you know, being in Costa Rica, it's a different culture and different things, and you know, there's women down there that get pregnant at 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, very young, right? And I thought, oh my God, you know, from the way I'm brought up, that's horrible. You got to fix that. And they go, no, 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 I, we don't have children, we have friends. So what do you mean? Because we're so close in the generational thing, there's no gap that we can relate to them, and we have friends, not just you know, sons and daughters, we have friends. And I'm like, wow. And of course, you know, their bodies recover faster, their health is better, and so on and so forth. So their way of thinking, the mass majority of the world is, and it seems to be for a woman, having kids early is is uh, is, is is a good thing, I guess. So uh, not in all cases, of course, but it was just, it was very interesting. It was like, wow, I never really thought of it that way. You know, the generation gap, because most people in the Western world want to do a lot of things, then have children later, and then you can't relate to your kids because the generation gap, the ages, the things have changed around you in the environment so much. So I was like, wow, that's really cool. So anyway, so back to 16 years of education and only three years from the convenience of your laptop, you know, at a fraction of the cost. So when I showed the kids this, they started asking the big questions, and then I'm like, so I said, so why do you believe you're the last generation? They said, well, it's human behavior that's the problem, the lack of self-esteem. I said, well, what if you could own, run, and design your own school system? They went, wow. I said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. Maybe I could share some ways with you. We could look at making money from the things you already do on a daily basis. And they're like, wow, that would be cool. So we showed them how to monetize, and they came up with a few different things, right? Now it's, you know, uh, taxi rides and e-bikes, right, and a bicycle shop with repairs and sales and stuff like that, which is the core now, which makes sense. Everything comes from a bicycle shop, as we said earlier, right? So that's pretty cool. E-bikes are cool. Right, bikes are cool. So, the um, we said, why don't we take all the alumni from 16 years that have been doing this all over the world with this whole new project, bring them together, and then they can help in a critical mass to be able to help everybody around the world. These other kids, because you'll have critical mass that people will get this, and then you have a kid, you have a school that's run, designed, and and owned, you know, and managed by kids for kids, right? Uh, and they're like, wow. So we came up with unzombify.com, which is, instead of being a search engine, it's actually a, a find engine because parents always want you to find stuff for them on the Internet. They don't know how to use Google or they'll pull down tab to make it more specific for your search criteria and stuff like that. So, so the kids are like, hey, you know, I, you know, I've worked with ISPs and, uh, and technology, so I know that kids, 80%, 90% of the time, are the consultants that show adults how to buy it, how to set it up, how to maintain it, what software to download, all this stuff and so on. Because it's cool for them. It gives them something to do. It gives them self-esteem. gives them a feeling of belonging and, and a value in, in the family unit and stuff like that. So I said to the kids, I said, well, you're not getting paid for that. And they're like, no. I said, well, you need something motivational. You need a mantra. You need something that's going to you know, really rock the boat, right? So you need a movement and you need a... Uh, you know, uh, an event to make this, to start the movement. And they're like, okay. I said, but what, what really gets you when your parents say something that's very emotional that makes you, you know. So they came up with a bunch of things. The one thing that was the most that they all definitely said, yeah. It's when our parents go, 
it's my rules, it's my house, and under my roof, you have to follow my rules and do this and that and that and that. And I went, wow. I said, well, let's look up on the internet and find some kids. The guy that, you know, invented Firefox that became the Chrome browser that works at Google that I met hung out at his house, right? I said, so, you know, at the age of 17, you know, uh, from New Zealand, this kid got a billion dollars from Google. And they're like, what? That's not real. So they're looking at this shit, and they look at all these other entrepreneurs that are not not even 18. Most all of them are under the age of 18. They got millions and millions of dollars for things that they're doing, right? You know, I got a 13-year-old kid reorganizing the the Congress of you know the Library of Congress from their software standpoint. You know, a 14-year-old kid that turned off the environmental systems for 15 minutes on the International Space Station from a computer because he just could, and he was screwing around. These are real things that happen every day that people don't talk a lot about. But there are some documentaries that I pointed them to. And they went, wow, we are powerful. The one that got them the most was, and I highly recommend, you got to look at what happened in Egypt because there was a, a young guy that was using social media, so they call it Kids with Keyboards that Changed the World, right? There's a 60 Minutes episode where he's, you know, one hour where they interview this guy. And he was a marketing manager for Google. And he didn't like what was going on because Egypt has, you know, as far as the populace goes, a lot of youth with, without work. And they have a dictator. And, you know, the way they govern things over there, it's not in favor of the people by any means. So they started to rebel. People started getting missing and killed and pictures on social media. So he decided he was going to get involved. So he decided, he put up a, a page saying, you know, this, this guy that died could have been you, could have been me, could have been any of us. we got to put a stop to this. So he did that, went missing for 30 days, came back, right, and, and, and wasn't killed because of the way he did things. you got to watch the story. It's unbelievable, but very true and very real. But he was able to, with social media, to get rid of a dictator of 30 years in 30 days with social media. That's what these kids did. And there was a ripple effect that happened across, you know, that part of the world over there that was quieted down very quickly. Because if a kid can do that, then there's no limits to what they can do, right? So then they got inspired. And without inspiration, nothing happens, right? And the kids were inspired and they were empowered and able to say, look, a thir a tw no, a 12-year-old girl going through puberty stimulates more buying in the marketplace than anything else. The guy that won the Nobel Peace Prize from Edinburgh for, for economics is the one that published that article. And that's what he won the Nobel Peace Prize for, showing that a 12-year-old girl going through puberty, right? And, you know, I've had some daughters, and I'll tell you, they're like Sybil, right? It's like, ah, and then, ah, and you're like, oh, oh, here's some money. Go to the mall. Leave me alone. Ah, shit. Oh, my God. That's crazy. So they, you know, we get a Barbie. Hopefully it's, you know, anatomically correct along with Ken. I don't know. I can't explain anything. Go away. Leave me alone. Ah. So, so they started to understand they actually are in power, right? And now that they had that realization, had the proof statements, they were like, huh, well, why don't we do what our parents do? If the pay sucks and the environment and the conditions are horrible, why don't we just go on strike worldwide from school? Because everybody that's rich right now and is in power making things happen, like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. Steve Jobs was an orphan, dropped out of school. Okay. Uh, the guy from Facebook, you know, Ashburgers and some other issues, obviously, from watching the movie, but he dropped out of school. And uh, Bill Gates dropped out of school. They all dropped out of school. You know, what's, what's, so if you're in school, if you complete school, then you end up building somebody else's dream and not your own, is what they came to the conclusion of. And I went, oh, so you don't have any dreams. That's so sad. No, no, we have dreams. We have dreams. I said, oh, well, then. Maybe you shouldn't necessarily drop out, but maybe just try it for a day. Even just become friends and pay homage to the future Steve Jobs of the world, right? And become friends with them. Get a few shares. Could make you mm -hmm. rich. Even if you're not the smartest person or not cut out to be an entrepreneur and you go back to school. So why don't you take one day to pay homage to that? And they're like, wow. So we're going to go on strike one day for the whole world and get all the kids. I said, well, what about the other kids that get dropped off at school and there's a barbed wire fence and they're in kindergarten or whatever? They'll do a work slowage. Oh, okay, all right, a work slowage. Okay, so you you know you got to sit in or something like that. Okay, so you're going to do this worldwide. Okay, so what's going to happen next? How are you going to monetize that? Oh, we're going to have YouTube videos where you have advertising on it, and then we'll put a message up there going, hey, we've had enough. You know, we're not taking it anymore, right? You parents are no longer controlling. We're letting you know. And then one kid was brilliant. He says, we need to add one thing to that. He says, what? 
no tech support for any adults worldwide for one day from any kid. <laughs> oh, I went, oh, 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 ow, 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 ow. I said, wow. I said, can I be excluded from that? I said, because I need tech support on a daily basis for you kids. So I was like, whoa, oh my God, this is going to happen. This is wild. They're going to they're gonna stop the world on a dime and get them to listen and then monetize. So on zombify.com, they're just going to put up all of the searches they've done. Some of them are entertainment. Some of them are actually, you know, uh, have stuff in it where you've gone, wow, I've always wondered what that was all about. But these kids see things with a filter that's very different. So they're very altruistic, and things are horizontally traded, and you know, uh, cradle to cradle, cradle to grave. So uh, you know, like a like a lawnmower. Did I explain the lawnmower thing last time about what happened with the lawnmower? No. Okay, so one of the kids was said, you know, my dad's going to go buy a lawnmower in spring. He's going to get it from aisle nine from Walmart. And I go, oh, okay, all right. He says, but then it's going to break because it's cheap and it's all my fault. And he's going to beat up on me. And I'm like, yeah, and it's a boat anchor and it's stupid and it's not that way wide and it's not that great. And I'm like, so what are you going to do about it if you had enough? And he goes, well, I'll research with a bunch of friends online. So he found out that batteries were not necessarily the best answer and they were heavy and expensive. That just plug it in, prop, you know, plug a plug-in one, which is very cheap and uh, very good for the environment. Uh, and the most efficient way to do it was to get a plug-in lawnmower. The trouble was nobody buys them because of the cord. It's inconvenient. So he, he found a YouTube video that showed you how to, you know, go from a certain you know position on the lawn and go around and once he did that it was fine the cord never got in the way it was perfect it was fine it was much lighter than having batteries or a motor and the vibration sure. and the smell so he's like okay so he goes to dad and says here you go dad says nah aisle nine walmart i'm still gonna get that it's cheaper uh, i'm just gonna go with what i did before so he goes well what if it was cheaper oh if it was cheaper i'd just get it so price is your only concern dad yep yep price is my only concern dad says so they were pretty honest with each other so he says, well, now I'm going to go out and go to the manufacturer and see if I can get an order like Groupon from a whole bunch of people and get maybe 100 units from a whole bunch of people. So he did that, and then bang. So he got it cheaper. So dad got it. It was great for the environment. He's happy with it. He's got self-esteem. He has a feeling of value. And they say they're in the business of self-esteem. That's what a school's for. It's in the business of self-esteem. Unfortunately, the existing school system is to actually do the opposite, is to make sure you have zero self-esteem, so you do not ask questions, and you have things repeated to you over and over to the point where you don't question anything, you just follow instructions. And that served us in the past. It no longer serves us anymore, right? So they're going to go on strike and do this. And then this website on zombify.com becomes like a consumer guide because you change buying behavior because we have this disease called consumption. We're consumers, and through consumerism, we're consuming resources at an ungodly rate, including it's like the horse. You know, It starts eating its tail. Eventually, something doesn't smell good, and it stops, right? Because it's not a good idea to eat your own tail, right? <laughs> so <laughs> apparently, things are starting to stink, but we haven't stopped, right? So the kids are going to unzombify the parents. They're going to make it so that there is a place they can go to, and they're basically a, a research group. And they're going to monetize this find engine versus a search engine. And a really fine point to this, and this is, this is something really, really controversial, okay? Because when working with Google, I call them the Borg, kind of affectionately, but they will assimilate. Resistance is futile, and they may drive your market to zero as a partner which is pretty scary, right? And, you know, I would say things that make them very nervous. They didn't want me to repeat, you know, but, hey, I have Ashburger, so I've got a doctor's note to be a, you know, a dick if I want to, right? I don't know what everybody else's excuse is. I have a doctor's note, but the, anyway, the bottom line is is that uh, with, with Google, I, I, I used to do things like, oh, we are Google. Please do not attempt to adjust your internet. We are in control. <laughs> you know, like outer limits, right? But for the serious side, though, from a factual standpoint, uh, I was looking for a BMW, right? And I'm searching online. And the more I'm using my Gmail, the more I'm searching with the search engine from Google, the more I'm, you know, documents, whatever, in their ecosystem, the more these ads come up and they're more and more targeted and more better to the mileage I want, the year I want, the color I want, the tires, the rims, everything. This was crazy. I was like, wow, I'm watching this. The more information I put in, the better the targeted ads became. So I go get a BMW. But I had to go four way, hours away. Thanks to the people like me. Like we, we market us, we advertise the traffic people. That's exactly what we do. You know, we learn yeah. as much about what you're looking for and then, you know, kind of send you down this narrow tunnel and give you all the information that, that is relevant to the search you started with. That's true. But, you know, 
it's your business model that becomes your Achilles heels these days, right? Because Google doesn't compete with Microsoft. What they do is make what they do free and make money from the analytics to do exactly what you're talking about, yeah. right? So it's an engineering firm that provides access to real-time uh, analytics that you can query to be able to do targeted advertising. That's their business. Most people have no idea what Google does. It's an engineering firm that provides a live pipe to live profiles that you can query to be able to make, you know. But their business model is interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, I went and got my BMW, right? I come home, and literally two blocks away on the way back, I find a better car for a better price with all the things that I wanted. Why didn't Google tell me that one? Because my profile was being connected with another profile based on the highest bidder, not based on the best relationship. So whether it be a person or an event or a, a product or a service, anything you're looking for, you're going to be led down this garden path, but it's not going to be the best fit profile to profile. It's always going to have a disconnect. So that is the Achilles heel and the downfall of Google in the future, is that their existing revenue model and being public uh, keeps them from being able to get to the next model. That's why Microsoft tried to buy Yahoo and was unsuccessful to be able to make their software subsidized or free with revenue advertising. They just, they just, they had to cannibalize. They had to cut their arms and legs off to join the race. It was, it's impossible. Now, people who have been uh, the industry long enough, they remember the search engine called Overture, mm -hmm. which doesn't exist anymore. It actually became Yahoo, uh, paid ads. But back then, uh, it was all about the bid price, so whoever pays more would, would show up higher. Mm -hmm. Like Google has this formula where you have to be relevant, so it's a combination of your bid price and relevancy. Mm -hmm. right? And that's how Google won in the market wars. Mm -hmm. But now, as you're saying, like it, it may, might not be good enough. It might not be good enough for the future. Yeah, because if you really want something that finds you what you're looking for, right, very specifically, that's, uh, you know, those ads can make it so you can click away and then you do something with that, right? Or your, your experience when you search is very different than somebody else when they search because it has a memory of everything else before. So it, it ha it's, it's good in one way because it's familiar, but your ability to be able to have new experiences is a bit of a challenge when you're, you know, using a browser that you're logging into all the time because it's, it's keeping you very focused on your special interests. It doesn't help you to expound your... So I always use, I use a browser half the time without being logged in, and it's a, it's a whole new experience, right? Mm -hmm. You're just like, wow, I didn't even know this stuff existed, right? Because Google's got me shoehorned because it wants to make me, to, to keep me in. I, I call the people at Google because they're all very young, and they said, hey, Andrew, what do you think? We, we hired all the smartest people. I said, yeah, but I don't even know if they're actually doing anything. They said, well, we don't know either, but we have all the smart people and you don't. And I'm like, well, that's a point. I get that. Uh, I said, but they look like veal to me. They're all in these little boxes, and you, you feed them properly. You give them massages and free food and everything and so on, and then you slaughter them very young when they're tender. And they didn't like that. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's just the way my mind works, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, where we are with, um, with the kids for monetizing, they started doing this, this soul searching, right, and this, uh, this self-directed learning. And I said, well, you know, one kid said, well, money's evil or whatever. And I said, well, yeah, I always find that poor people always say that. I've never seen any rich people say that money's evil. You know that? It's very interesting, right? You should take a survey. <laughs> I said, maybe, you know, it's not, you know, what are, you know, how do you change the world? Where does behavior come from? They said school systems, the media, corporations, and government. I said, oh, okay, there you go. I said, do you believe in the Illuminati? Oh, yeah. I said, oh, come on. If an alien landed on this planet, would it look like we actually are organized or there's a plan or somebody running the place? No. We're killing ourselves slowly. <laughs> we're not even efficient at killing ourselves. I said, so come on. I said, come on, let's get real here. There's no Illuminati. And what are corporations made out of? People. Your parents. Right? What, what are the schools made out of? What is you know, the media made of? You know, you vote every time you buy something. Every time you engage, you add energy to it, right? So there's a cause and there's an effect, right? If you focus on the cause, you can change things. If you focus on the effect, you only get more of that effect. Whatever you focus on in quantum physics, in life, in religion, in whatever, that's what you'll get more of, right? You can either respond or react. If you respond, that's positive, says the doctor, right? You've responded to the medication. If you react, that's negative. 
right? And that's gonna it's gonna give you a worse you know experience, right? So you have to focus on that. And how do you change behaviors? So they looked up and found out that dolphins and indigenous people, even plants, that if a dolphin in the pod is doing something that's not conducive to the happiness and longevity of, of the pod, it, it ostracizes, they ostracize that one dolphin. Indigenous people, that was their penal colony, that was their way to be able to punish people or to be able to get rid of them, right? Uh, even cannibalism, when I went to Fiji and the, the islands north there, I found out that cannibalism is not, you know, it's like cowboys and Indians on TV, that's not the real story, right? The bottom line is, is that cannibalism was if you killed somebody, you had to eat them right after you killed them, entirely, raw. And that was a huge deterrent for anybody to want to kill anybody else. And everybody would make you eat them, that person that you killed. Right? So it wasn't about a warrior and eating them and taking on their energy or anything like that. So things get twisted down the line. Right? So it's interesting to find out how human behavior actually comes about. Right? You know, some woman getting stoned to death you know, in another country and they're focused on you know, the woman. When I said, well, why don't you focus on the man and how does he believe that he should be able to stone that woman to death? What gives him the right to do that? That was an environmental thing. Right? Nature versus nurture. Right? The bottom line is, is that you need to change the behavior system from the culture standpoint, get to the root of the cause, right? That's where you can change things, where everybody's focused on the effect. And that's where all the advertising goes to, and that's where the drama is, and that's where everybody goes. And you get caught up in it. And it's easy to get caught up in that, right? But as George Carlin says, I love watching CNN. All these people dying for my entertainment. It's amazing. I love it, <laughs> right? Because what can you do about it? You can't. So, and when you're focusing on that, you're pulling away from what you can do in that moment with the people that are with you, local in your life. And that, that's just sad. That is so sad that you're complaining about some people over ISIS or whoever it is at the end of the day. But meanwhile, all you're doing is adding more energy to that same situation, right? Or at the very least, you're not taking any actions to change anything whatsoever at all. In your own life, in that moment, with the people that you can actually be with. You're, you're just you're just you're just absent. You're no longer there, right? You're a zombie, right? So, how to change human behavior? Ostracize. So the kids went great. We have proof. So we'll just ostracize all the parents and all the schools. <laughs> and I went, yay! Let's do that. You know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Go Ferris Bueller, right? Let's do that. So then I said, so what about this money thing being evil? I said, why don't you research money? So they went, oh, yeah, that's a good, well, we all want to research money. Yeah, okay. I said, what's the longest lived currency ever in the world? So they looked it up. Chocolate, cacao, raw chocolate, so like the bean or the nut, right? Um, for 7,000 years, Incas, Mayans, Aztecs, uh, Egyptians, uh, Chinese, uh, many cultures. Um, and they find people buried with it all the time and people know about chocolate ceremonies and stuff and so on. So what, what happened was that the reason it was a currency is really, really simple. Um, no matter where you live on the planet, there are seasons within seasons and cycles within cycles and you're going to have good crops and you're going to have bad crops and sometimes you'll have a few years of bad crops, right? And some bad seasons. So cacao, chocolate, from the chocolate tree, cacao, is actually the, uh, the best superfood on the planet. So you can store it dry, and then what happens is if your crops are down, you can supplement, supplement your diet with this, with these, these dry goods that is, you know, the best food you can have, right? Now the magic about this currency is that it's the only thing that man has not been able to monoculture. Now I'm slowing this down because this is everything, mm -hmm. okay? You cannot plant this like, you know... A, you know, like soy or corn or no, it won't grow. It wheat. Need, right, it needs companion plants, multiple. In fact, it needs the shade of an old growth rainforest to be able to grow. So it's the only thing we've not been able to monoculture, right? You know, like you know, like a hair transplant for a man, right? You know, you just you know, he's just in a row, right? That, right? That's that's what it's all about, right? These days is is that type of monoculture, which is you know deteriorating the soil and it's going off into the ocean and you know all this stuff is happening because of our mass farming techniques right so very important so what is chocolate chocolate is oxygen because the more demand you create for the chocolate the more you create for a rainforest which stabilizes the environment which gives us more oxygen and clean air and clean food and clean water right because it's the filtration system it's everything that's the heart and the lungs of the planet 
right? That's the filtration system. So when you, you, you turn it back into a currency again, which the kids want to do worldwide, and they're doing, right? I'm like, well, we got to make it sexy and relevant, though. So why don't you take something like Bitcoin, which has got a lot of fluctuations to it, and stabilize it by backing it with chocolate. So, like, you know, we used to have the gold standard, and now it's the oil standard for the U.S. dollar. Why don't you take cacao and back it there and make it sexy? And they went, whoa, that would be cool. I said, and it'd be the only currency in the world that truly actually gets carbon credits. So, so it's a uh, currency that earns you money. Dollar to choco dollar. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, I'm in Costa Rica with all the indigenous people. I said, look, I watch Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. You all look like Oompa Loompas to me. I said, this looks like a good deal. Let's open up a chocolate factory. <laughs> Oompa Loompa Doopa Dee Doo. <laughs> Let's make chocolate work for you. <laughs> right? So, you know, maybe maybe not be the best way to put it. You know, that may be my Ashburgers kicking in there, you know, about Oompa Loompas. But anyway, because <laughs> when I watch the movie... I was young, but I my, my mind works differently. Mom says, what did you think of the movie? Did you like Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? I said, I need a bunch of really, you know, small brown people to make me money, right? That's how this works, right? <laughs> They're like, oh, that's not a good thing. But that's really what the movie shows you, right? So anyway, so... I've been hanging out with a shaman in Costa Rica that has uh, that represents 18,000 indigenous people in Costa Rica. The the head lawyer that represents the indigenous peoples for North America is actually Canadian. We hung out with him, and now we I, I said, hey, why don't you stop complaining and being Betty Boop and being the victim? You know, because then if, the more you talk about that, the more you become the victim, right? Victims make themselves into victims. I know it sounds harsh, but that is the reality. Okay. And it happens over and over. People go, why did you go back to that abusive type of situation after you took you out of it? Because it's all they know. It's their comfort zone, right? It's what they grew up with. It's their environment, right? So, so I said to the uh, native guys down there, I said, hey, you've got the, you know, the cleanest air, food, and water on the planet. You win the planetary index for the happiest people. It's a blue zone. Where people live longer. It's the most biodiverse place on the planet. I said, this place is amazing. They said, yeah. I said, so what's happening? I said, well, you know, the white people and the consumerism stuff starting to encroach upon us. And I'm like, yeah. I said, well, why don't you turn the tables? So what do you mean? I said, well, you guys have the best quality cacao in the world. And they're like, yeah, we do. And it's just growing there. It's it's like for free. You guys want my electric bikes and you want internet, electricity, and all these other things from this world. I said, so, hey, why don't you reverse it? Why don't I get the beads and you get the goods? And they're like, oh, we give you cacao, you give us electric bikes that also give us internet and electricity and transportation. And I went, yeah, and some solar panels to go with it. And they're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, we give you some cacao that grows here naturally. So I said, by the way, people want something called nearshore. They don't want offshore anymore because you don't want to put your money in Turks and Caicos or, you know, it just happened in Panama, right? That's not a good idea. Oh, my God. But instead of casinos, why don't the indigenous people simply become the nearshore because they have their own rules within your own country, including in Canada. So why not turn the tables? Why don't they become the banking system for us? Because they have the currency. They have what backs the currency. How do you dictate what happens on this planet? You have to have that spice, that gold, that oil, that titanium, the rare earth metals, whatever that may be that makes it that, you know, gets you more of that, that dollar, that thing that goes around for currency, right? So that makes sense. So I said, you guys already have the thing that everybody needs now because of our situation, right? And you get carbon credits to go on top of that. And they're like, yay! So we wrote everything all up, and we're working with them to be able to do that. So we're going to set up indigenous people with a little franchise worldwide where they can set up their own you know, credit union trust because a credit union a trust is much better than a bank. It's, it's, it's for the people, by the people, owned by the depositors. Much better model. So they're choosing that. And they're going to use Bitcoin, back it with cacao, and collect carbon credits. So it's the only currency that, while it sits in your pocket, actually earns you money. Okay? Because you get carbon credits. It's the only thing that they can actually absolutely quantify with every bean because they know that that plant has to have these symbionts you know, plants around it for a rainforest. So what do we do? We just empower the indigenous people because what we need to do is we have a, we need to, a decentralization of indigenous information to save civilization. Okay, so I'll just, you know, I'm turning into a rapper here or something, I don't know. But at the end of the day, we need a melding of both worlds. It's not one or the other. We're not going back to live in caves or being nomads. That's not going to happen. But they like certain things about us. 
we like certain things about them. So it's the best of breed, best of fit that's going to make it through to the other side. That's what's about to happen. I had no idea we were going to go where we were going to go, and I didn't know we were going to go this far and cover such a, a wide territory here. Like, I thought we were going to talk about kids in schools and that kind of stuff. Now we're talking about cacao and bitcoins. Well, the kids figured something out, which was without money, they have no power, right? They can sway things on the Internet and get rid of a dictator, but at the end of the day, those people still are having a really bad time of things. So, you know, and they say it's because when that dictator left, he took a whole bunch of money before and after mm. and during, and now they're in an even worse position. So it's not that you have to get rid of the actual leader. It's you have to be your own leader. And the only way to do that is to monetize what you do that's your passion, that's working well, that is in concert with nature in the world. So that's why I'm saying this, because at the end of the day, we could talk about all these things. For the kids, by the kids, the lunatics need to take over the asylum, no Ritalin, please, save the humans. All sounds great. But in this world right here, right now, in this moment, you are not changing jack shit unless you have a lot of money. That's how you do it. You, you know, if you break rules and you're a corporation or an individual, well, it's pretty easy to make sure that you lobby with a bunch of money, which is now unlimited in the United States, of how much you can lobby with. And you know, the senators and you know, they hire what the judges and the Supreme Court. So at the end of the day, as long as you have lots of money, you make the rules. And even if you break the rules, you, they don't apply to you. You know, I'm being very blunt, right? So if you want to change the rules and make new rules and don't want the old rules to apply to you, you need a shitload of money. And that is your plan. And but at the end of the day, you know, uh, it's up to people to enable and empower this stuff. You know, my near death experience, my ayahuasca trips, I came back with this information, but it also told me that not everybody's gonna wake up or want to do this, because it's scary to understand that you are in control of every moment. As the Buddhist monk says, right? The wonderful thing about life is you get everything you ask for. The scary thing about life is you get everything you ask for. So, once you have that realization that it's not something outside of you and that you're not just, you know, going like this and the car is going down the road at 80 miles an hour and you end up in the ditch and it's somebody else's fault, it's not the car's fault. You took your hands off the wheel, you are the one in control of your life and your own destination. Until you do that, you know, you're just, you know, you're just a victim of everybody else. You're just, a, you know, in a pinball game, right? So, be the flipper, don't be the ball, right? You know? Don't like the game, don't hate the player, don't hate the game, make a new game, right? Change it, be the ball, right? Do, do these things, right? Do it differently, right? But they need to empower themselves some, somehow economically and to change the buying behavior of people in consumerism. So this is an actual plan and it actually works. Whether people implement it or how many people implement it, that depends because there's, you know, every 26,000 years and cycles within cycles, you know, things change, right? And the Inca Mayan calendar ended, right? And people went, oh, we're still fine. Well, at the end of the day, we're not because you wouldn't, <laughs> to give people warning, it would end and then give you a bit of time to be able to change your behavior. But what I was trying to tell is if you don't change your behavior by this point, then once you go past that point, like if you're in a Bugatti Veyron, you're going 200 miles an hour and you're on top gear, there's these pylons and a white line there, and if you hit the brakes at that point, you don't run off the end of the runway, right? And you don't kill yourself. Well, we accelerated because we lowered the prices of, of, of oil. And then you've got Obama and Trudeau freaking out, going, oh my God, the oceans are going to rise twice as high and twice as fast as what we thought. Lions, tigers, and bears, oh no, chicken little, the sky is falling. It's very, very real. These guys are taking it very seriously and trying to change things and, and, and signing things like they've never signed before and stuff like that. This stuff is very, 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 very real. And, you know, uh, the climate is changing drastically very quickly now, so we're all taking notice. We're all taking notice where it was happening very slowly. You know, that whole, you know, Al Gore thing where you put the frog in the water and if you turn it up slowly with the heat, he stays in there and you cook him alive. But if you turn it up quickly, boom, the frog jumps out. Right, because of the contrast, out of contrast comes clarity. Well, now the heat is, you know, is getting turned up quickly. Well, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Well, uh, hopefully, when the uh, music stops, you have a seat, you have a chair. Uh, I would, uh, you know, if you understand what I'm saying, then you should really research things for yourself. You know, be your own judge. Um, uh, and a question, do you think that, uh, you know, Noah actually told all the animals that he was only going to pick two of each species? I don't think so. So 
this happens many times and it's about to happen again. I mean, there's lots of proof. Just go look it up for yourself. So there's a lot of people who are not going to make it through the other side, and it's going to happen very quickly, and it's not in years, okay? It's happening very soon, okay? And if you do your own research, you'll figure this out. Or if you don't want to because, you know, you'll come back as something else or whatever and so on, you, you had enough, that's fine. I, I, I understand that. I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to be able to be somebody in a cross or, or Mother Teresa. That's an old model. doesn't serve anybody. They learn from that, right? Not interested, right? So for the people that don't make it through the other side, uh, there's, you know, we depleted the fish by 90%. So, you know, it makes sense they're going to repopulate by eating all the floating people, which is okay, because I'll name a sushi dish after all of you. It's okay. I, I don't mind, right? And if you want to, here's a little hint. The Incas, the Mayans, the Tibetans, Peruvians, Sierra Indians, if you think about all these, where are they? They call them the Sierra Mountains, right? Well, they're six to 8,000 feet up. Why? Because there's water and food source there, and the cloud mass is below them. Where is all the issues? So if, if, if something like a, a meteor hits here and ash and clouds or a volcano goes off or nuclear you know, stuff or, or uh, biological or anything, it's all in the cloud mass. It's all in the cloud mass. So as long as you're above that, you have the cleanest air, food, and water on the planet, and you can survive anything that happens. Even in the disaster movies, it's always that guy on the side of the mountain that lives, right? Everybody else dies down below from the 1,000-foot tsunami. And there is proof, and it is very real, there have been 1,000-foot tsunamis in the past. So, you know, a surfboard's not going to help you. It'd be a hell of a ride, but I don't think you're going to live to tell about it. There may not even be anybody to tell about it, actually. <laughs> so, anyway, so, so there you go. Uh, using the carrot as the stick. At the end of the day, I'm not here to talk about doom and gloom. I'm talking about real research, real things. Do it yourself. It just could just be entertainment or it could be an awakening and, an, and, and uh, you know, something for somebody out there. And that's really what this is. I'm just here to be able to help people to go, hey, maybe you should look at this. You know, self-preservation is a big motivator. At the end of the day, I am not an environmentalist. I am not a tree hugger. At the end of the day, I'm a self-centered son of a bitch that wants clean air, clean food, clean water, and my neighbors are screwing it up, and I'm going to figure out a way to be able to change that. And that's, that's self-preservation, and that, that works. People get that shit. Not a bunch of, woo, that kumbaya stuff doesn't work, okay? We need a real plan with real people doing real things, not yakking about a bunch of shit. Well, Andrew, I think that's a wrap. That was an interesting conversation. And uh, uh, is there a call to action for someone? Like, do you want people to go somewhere, look up stuff? Yeah, and the easiest thing is is to relate to people is, you know, back to the not being a tree hugger and an airy fairy guy, right, or, you know, karma, kubaya, whatever type stuff. Real simple. If you go to the OptiBike website and you buy a bike, then you're helping to fund everything you're just talking about because we use funding from our projects to be able to do these projects, right, to enable and empower, to socially and economically uplift these kids with these things. So we're working with schools. We're working with indigenous people. That's what we're doing right now. So a portion of the funding from what we're doing is doing that. So to get this infrastructure in a box that costs 80 percent less, uh, you know, to three billion people is our goal. So it's kind of like the Robin Hood thing. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you buy a bike and two kids somewhere else get another bike, right? In the indigenous world, you know, that's really what this is all about. We're just in the process of formalizing that. But when you buy the bikes, you're actually empowering, enabling kids around the world and a cleaner, you know, a cleaner world. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to come to the show today. And uh, it'll take me some time to wrap my head around all, everything that we discussed today. <laughs> Lots of homework. <laughs> for sure. Awesome. Thank you.